Um, bueno, buenas tardes a todo el mundo. Uh, hello, everybody. It's a um, great pleasure to welcome here today uh, Professor Amy Wilkinson from the University of Chicago. Um, Amy Wilkinson is a, a renowned expert on dynamical systems. Uh, she obtained her doctorate from Berkeley University in California, and after that, she was a postdoc at Harvard and spent uh, a few years in Northwestern before joining the University of Chicago in 2012. Uh, she has proved um, a very impressive array of profound results uh, that have been the recipient of um, many awards, among others the, SOT, the SATA Prize and the Levi L. Conant Prize. She was an invited speaker at the International Congress of Mathematicians back in 2010, and she is a fellow of the American Mathematical Society uh, since 2013. She has directed, I think, about 10 PhD theses and has written yeah, many papers which have appeared in the most prestigious mathematics journals. And today she is here uh, in inverted commas, at least, um, and we'll be talking about the mathematics of déjà vu. And so it's a pleasure, and yeah, thank you for joining us today, Professor Wilkinson. Thank you very much, Fernando. Um, I would also like to take this opportunity to thank the organizers of the Matemáticas en la Residencia um, for this opportunity to speak. Um, I'm really excited to give this talk. And I would like to thank my friend, uh, Professor Lorenzo Diaz, who helped me um, translate some of the transcript of this talk. So before I begin. All right. So the following three questions have several important features in common. The first, how can we discover new planets orbiting around distant stars? The second, how do we build a particle accelerator capable of accelerating protons to extremely high energies close to the speed of light? Third, what deep patterns are hiding in the whole numbers? One, two, three, four, and so on. Scientists answer questions like these using techniques from a field called dynamical systems. All of the questions that I've just um, stated concern a mathematical version of deja vu, which is called recurrence. The phrase deja vu translates literally from the French, already seen. It describes the psychological sensation of having seen something before, but not being sure exactly when. So I hope you'll forgive a silly illustration of deja vu. So about a year ago, I started to take long walks in the mornings. This was an opportunity to get out of the house as it was during the pandemic, everything was closed and I saw no people on the street. But I did get to know very well the local animals, especially the geese, who cared for a large number of goslings. It was like a goose kindergarten. Now I've continued these walks over the year as a way to bring some variety to my days that otherwise are hard to differentiate from each other. This spring, the pandemic has continued its course, but people are being vaccinated and Chicago is starting to come to life. And I've begun to see reminders of the goose kindergarten from last year. Baby animals, but different types of animals. Deja vu? What does this have to do with mathematics? Well, in mathematics, we have our own version of deja vu, which we call recurrence. The common English name recurrence and its mathematical meaning are actually pretty close. Both describe something that happens more than once in time, like a recurrence of an illness, a recurrence of a thought. 
to talk about something happening over time, we need a mathematical theory that studies evolution over time. That is the field of dynamical systems. That's my field, or dynamics for short. In dynamics, we consider a system, which is just a collection of things that we call states. This collection can be finite or infinite. The system is subject to a set of rules. Now, these rules can be given by equations, by the laws of physics, a set of directives, etc. The system evolves over time by applying the rules. The system combined with the rules is called a dynamical system. I will give an example on the next slide, but you can also think of the planets in our solar system moving around the sun according to the, the laws of gravity. If the system repeats itself over time, we say it's recurrent. For example, once a year, the earth returns to the same position. This is an example of recurrence. Here's an even simpler example. So in this example, our system is finite, just, just a collection of six states depicted by blue dots. The rules here are given by arrows. They indicate where to move under a unit of time. So there are the states, and the, those are the rules depicted by the purple arrows. Okay, so let's watch a state. So let's pick a state, call this an initial state, and let's watch it evolve over time according to these rules. So here's our initial state. Well, under one unit of time, it's going to move according to the purple area, arrow sorry, to a different state. Under two units of time, it moves again. Three, four, five, six, after six iterates, or after six units of time, we return to the initial state. That is a form of recurrence. If we want to analyze in greater depth, we can watch all states evolve simultaneously over time. So if I label them clockwise around the circle, we can watch how these different initial states move. So iterates, the word iterates is appearing. So an iterate is one unit of time. And the verb to iterate means to move forward by one unit of time. So I will talk about iterates and iteration. Now notice that in this dynamical system, all states, not just the top one, have returned to their initial state after six iterates. This is called simple recurrence. I will return to the idea of simple recurrence in a few slides. Okay, so there's a picture. So in the real world, dynamical systems come in different guises. Let's look at five examples. These are scientific subjects that have been successfully modeled using dynamical systems. In all examples, recurrence is something we want to understand. Okay, the first example is celestial motion. For example, the motion of planets around the sun. In this example, the system, the set of states, is very complicated to describe, but the rules are simple. They're governed by the, the rules of gravity. Recurrence in planetary dynamical systems is why the Earth goes around the sun in 365 days, the seasons repeat every year, and why the moon circles the Earth in 27.3 days. Long-term weather and climate patterns are, are determined by part by a very complicated set of rules, but some of them, such as the tilt of the Earth causing the seasons, are relatively simple to define. On the left is a mathematical model based on weather prediction called the Lorentz Attractor. It is a dynamical system with complicated recurrent features. Populations of animals evolve over time according to rules determined by birth rate, migration patterns, food supply, and predation. Dynamical systems are used to model the spread of invasive species as pictured in the upper right 
and the population of fisheries on the lower right. On the microscopic level, dynamical systems can model the recurrence of cancer. And on the much more ma macroscopic level, there are dynamical systems in epidemiology that model the spread and recurrence of diseases like flu, Ebola, COVID-19. While it is incredibly complex, the brain is a dynamical system governed by biological rules. Brain waves are one way to measure the states of this system. Certain types of recurrence in brain dynamics are associated with pathology, such as epilepsy and bipolar disorder, which is pictured dynamically on the right. So brain waves that are too regular that return to their initial state over time in too regular of a way are actually a sign of some kind of pathology or uh, being under general anesthesia, for example, they're not the normal uh, active awake or even dreaming state of the brain. All right, so I wanna discuss three types of recurrence, simple recurrence, so I'm calling simple recurrence, chaotic recurrence, and what I'm calling mixed recurrence. Okay. These three terms, simple, uh, chaotic, and mixed, are kind of my own terms. I've made these up for the purpose of the talk, but they do, they can be formalized mathematically. And I think they capture the range of behaviors that one sees in a dynamical system, okay? So simple recurrence first. In simple recurrence, recurrence occurs at regular predictable intervals in time. And every initial like beginning state recurs at the same time. Any dynamical system that has only finitely many states, such as our example from the beginning, is simply recurrent. The only requirement is that two different states don't go to the same state. So as in this example that we looked at earlier. The reason for this is a mathematical fact called the pigeonhole principle. So imagine there are only finitely many ways that you can arrange these colored dots. Eventually, no matter what the rules, you'll have to start out where you begin, right? So if you have infinite amount of time, eventually, you have to come back to the original configuration. But once you've come back to the original configuration, you're playing by a deterministic set of rules, and so you have to repeat what you did before. Okay, so any finite system is simple, simply recurrent in the absolute strongest way. It comes back exactly to itself after finitely many iterates, and then it repeats itself. And here we see the coincidence of the beginning and the end. So the timeline in a recurrent system, a simply recurrent system, becomes a time circle. You, you start somewhere, you come back, and then time resets itself. The idea of time being a circle is itself a recurrent theme in human culture. So we are all quite familiar with this idea of, of simple recurrence, I think. Next, I'd like to turn to the topic of how you might discover an exoplanet using simple recurrence. You might've read in the news in the last 10 years of exciting discoveries of new planets in distant solar systems. The technical term for these planets outside of our solar system is exoplanets. Now finding exoplanets is a tricky business. Stars can be seen because they emit radiation. Planets do not emit any significant radiation. They can only reflect radiation or they can block radiation. So how do we see distant planets? The trick is to see the planets as they are reflected in the behavior of stars.
So the orbit of a planet around a star is simply recurrent, provided that the nearby stars and planets are not massive. If the planet is tiny, then the star will move in an ellipse around the star at a rate predicted by Kepler's law. The star will appear fixed. But if the exoplanet is massive enough and close enough, the star will also move under the influence of the planet. This is what is depicted here. In fact, sorry, this is what is depicted here. In fact, the star and exoplanet will circle around their common center of mass. This simple recurrent motion of the star can be detected using Doppler, etc. Even though the planet is too tiny to see, the period or time of recurrence gives information about the mass, density, and location of the planet. Other methods used to detect planets, such as looking for the planet to pass across the star, causing a flicker in the star's radiation, also exploit the simple recurrence of the system. Simple recurrence is rare in dynamical systems, but when it's there, it can be very useful. Next, I'd like to turn to chaotic recurrence. So in our timeline caricature, chaotic recurrence might look like this. So you wait a little, then you see something. Eh, you wait a little longer, then you see something else. And they're basically all the same thing, maybe not identical. And the amount of time it takes to see these very, very similar things is variable. So to construct our first example of a chaotic dynamical system, we start with a box with two chambers, one red and one white. We also have two balls, one red and one gray. At any given time, each ball can be in either chamber of the box. For our initial state, we put a red ball in the red half and a gray ball in the white half. The rules for this particular dynamical system require that we flip a coin. If it comes up heads, we move the red ball to the other chamber, the one that it's not presently occupying. If it comes up tails, we move the gray ball to the other chamber. Okay, so very simple set of rules. And in fact, you can summarize these rules in this diagram. So these are the possible states of our system. So there are only four states. Um, and there are rules, but now you see there are rules that there's not just one arrow from one uh, box to the other. There are arrows that depend on the flip of a coin, heads or tails. Okay. So what happens now if we flip a coin and we follow this set of rules? Um, what happens to our system? So. I'm going to show you two different possible outcomes where the times of recurrence are also recurrence are also different. So, okay, so I flip what did I flip here? I flip a heads and so I move the red to the other chamber and I flip tails and I move the gray to the other chamber. Maybe I flip tails. So I, now I move gray again to the other chamber. Heads and I've come back to where I started. Now, I'm not going to repeat necessarily what I've already seen because um, this is a ran there's a random component to this dynamical system. On the other hand, I could have, uh, in a few flips, so a very uh, similar set of flips, but then I flip a tails instead of a heads, and I haven't yet recurred. And maybe I flip a tail again and then a tail, and then a head, and so on. You know, maybe I don't ever re recur in this example. So it's impossible to tell by looking at, in this example, it's impossible to tell by looking at the first four iterates whether I'm going to recur or not. So that's another feature of chaotic recurrence. Okay, so let's calculate some odds. 
Okay. So if we flip a coin infinitely many times in this dynamical system, then the probability, and we have to put this now in terms of probabilities, the probability that this system never recurs is zero. Because the probability that it recurs in finitely many steps is very small. And as the number of iterates gets higher and higher, that probability goes to zero. So for example, after two flips of the coin, the chances that it is recurred is 50%. Okay, and you can see that in this diagram where um, if we start, for example, on the left, then how can I return in two flips? How can I recur in two flips? Um, after two flips of the coin, uh, now I'm confused by my own diagram. So I believe it should be 50%, um, but actually I think I should have said uh, four flips of the coin. Oh, uh, yeah, okay, so this is incorrect. I didn't notice this earlier, um, but okay. After seven flips of the coin, the chance that it's, it, this is correct. After seven flips of the coin, the chance that it is recurred is over 90%. So let's go back and correct what I said before. After two flips of the coin, there is no way to return to your initial state because um, if you flip ahead, then you move, say, to a box to the right, if I start at the bottom. And now if I flip, oh, I'm sorry, it is 50%. And then if I flip ahead again, um, I come back. And so in two flips, you could flip a head, head. You could flip a tail and a tail. Both of those will come back to where they start. But then there's a head, tail, and a tail, head. And those will not return to where they start. So it is 50%. After 13 flips of the coin, the chance that it has recurred is over 99.9%. .9%. So as you can see, it's not hard to believe that the probability that you never recur is zero. All right. So that's one way of thinking about uh, uh, of thinking about the odds. You can also ask, how many number of flips does it take? Do you expect it to take to re to get recurrence? Um, and in this particular example, you can see that the expected number of flips that it takes to recur is actually four, okay? So it's not surprising that that shouldn't be so surprising. All right. Now, what would happen if we kept the same basic setup as with this example, with the red and white chamber and with gray and red balls, but we added more balls to the system? say 50 red balls and 50 gray balls. To randomly choose a ball to move at each iteration, we would need a hundred sided die. Okay. So you can find such a die uh, if you talk to someone who plays games like Dungeons and Dragons, for example. Okay. So I use a hundred sided die Here's a time when I wish I could ask the audience a question. What do you think the odds are that the system will recur? So here, the initial system I've started with is all of the, the red balls in one half of the box and all of the gray balls in the other half of the box. So what would you think? What are the odds? Now I have a hundred sided die. What are the odds that I will return? So if you think about it, this isn't really that much different than the two-sided situation. It's just that it could take a lot more time for the recurrence to happen. So the chances are actually still 100% that the system will recur, will recur. So this is in fact a recurrent system. But this is a highly chaotic recurrent system. 
In fact, we can calculate the expected time for this system to recur. So remember when we had two balls, it took four iterates. We expect four iterates. Okay, so if we average all the number of possible times it might take, we get four. What about in this situation? So for this situation with 100 balls, 50 in each chamber, the expected number of die rolls needed is two to the 100th. Okay, so how long would that take? Well, suppose we were very, very fast and we could do one roll per second. That's four times 10 to the 22 years. So that's more than a trillion times the age of the universe. So this is not a game you should try at home. And you probably wouldn't want to make a bet on this happening. Well, you definitely wouldn't want to make a bet on this happening in your lifetime. So a third example, which is very closely related, is, uh, is uh, a more complicated system, which was invented by the physicist Ludwig Boltzmann in the 1800s to model the behavior of gas molecules in a box. So Boltzmann modeled the interaction of molecules by replacing them by balls that bounce off each other and against the walls of the box elast elastically, so with no loss of energy. So this model is called an ideal gas. It's completely deterministic. There's no flipping of a coin. You just start the, you start the boxes, or sorry, the balls in the box, and you give them an initial velocity, and you just let them bounce off each other. Here we have depicted two different gases by gray and red colored balls. So think of those as molecules. These two different gases will mix over time in a process called diffusion. Okay, so here's a picture of diffusion from Wikipedia. The 19th century astrophysicist and mathematician Henri Poincaré, who is the hero of almost everyone who studies dynamical systems. I even went and visited his grave in Paris once. Um, he proved that any closed physical system that conserves energy will eventually return to its starting state. In fact, there's a 100% chance that, that it will, just like with our our coin flipping example. This is a very general fact called Poincaré recurrence. Poincaré recurrence applies to the models we considered before and to ideal gases. In particular, there is a 100% chance that the initial configuration of molecules, that is the red in the red half and the gray in the white half will recur. If you wait long enough. And you can imagine how long that might be. So to summarize, even though chaotic recurrence is unpredictable on the level of individual orbits, we can make a lot of long-term predictions about the collective behavior of systems with chaotic recurrence. Field of statistical mechanics in physics is built on the study of chaotic recurrence and its related phenomena. So let's move now to what I call mixed recurrence. In mixed recurrence, some initial states will display simple recurrence and others will display chaotic recurrence. The simple and chaotic orbits will appear in this picture side by side. Okay, so it might not sound too crazy to you to hear that one of the biggest outstanding conjectures in pure mathematics involves proving that typical systems display some kind of mixed recurrence, where you see the simple and the chaotic recurrence occurring side by side. <clears throat> um, so in mixed recurrence, different initial states 
can have very different patterns of recurrence. For example, the, the guy with a pink head with chaotic recurrence might live next door to Mr. Greenhead with simple recurrence. That's the thing you should keep in mind. So to illustrate mixed recurrence, I'm going to tell you something about the design of particle accelerators. A particle accelerator is a machine that accelerates elementary particles, such as electrons or protons, to very high energies. They have a wide array of applications, from discovering new subatomic uh, particles to imaging chemical and biological processes to treating cancers. They produce x-rays that you can use to treat cancers. There are 30,000 particle accelerators worldwide in all sorts of shapes and sizes. I'm gonna show you a schematic for a common type of accelerator called a circular accelerator. In a circular accelerator, bunches of subatomic particles traveling at high speed are injected into a ring. High power static electromagnets bend and focus the particles in each bunch, each bunch of particles, and radio frequency or RF cavities accelerate the bunches. The bunches together travel in a circular orbit around the ring. The accelerated focus beam is eventually released from the circular ring and used for a variety of purposes, like what I described before. The design of particle accelerators is a delicate process, as you might imagine. There are hundreds of magnets of different types and strengths in a typical circular proton accelerator. Their strength, type, and position control the shape of the orbit and how focused it is, you know, features of how the, the bunch travels around. The goal of designing a particle accelerator is to keep the particles inside the accelerator focused and on track. To give a quick sense of scale, in the Large Hadron Collider at CERN in Switzerland, where the Higgs boson particle was discovered, the width of the beam is 0.14 millimeters. Okay, so that's the width of a human hair on the same order. The circumference of the ring, on the other hand, is 27 kilometers or about 17 miles. Okay, so that's the circumference. You've got a, a, a bunch, the width of a hair, and it's traveling around a 27 kilometer track. The width of the ring is four centimeters. And so it has to stay in this four centimeter uh, cross-sectional area uh, for a 27 uh, kilometers going around once. Um, the energy of the beam is uh, seven uh, teravolts, which is the equivalent of 100 semi-trucks that are traveling at 100 kilometers per hour. So the energies are huge. Now, the particles in the beam, they move nearly the speed of light, and they must stay in the accelerator for more than a billion turns. Okay, so multiply 27 kilometers by a billion. So no matter how you design it, the accelerator will display mixed recurrence. This is just the feature of the dynamics of this accelerator, okay, and the types of magnets you need to use to keep it going in a, in a circle. So here is a toy model of a particle accelerator. The colored lenses represent different types of magnets. The pink dots represent two initial states. Let's watch them over time. One of them is simply recurrent, and one of them is chaotic. So you've got to, my question is, which is which? Well, let's see. So this was produced by Dave Rubin at um, Cornell University. Uh, the picture in the middle is, if you like, it's the location um, of the particle bunch as it crosses. And there are two components. There's position and there's velocity or momentum. 
And so what's depicted in the center of these two circles is where the pink dot starts in its momentum and its or position and its momentum. And every time this particle goes along the circle, that dot changes. It, it moves somewhere else. Okay, so the one on the right appears quite simple, right? It just looks like it's visiting three different spaces. And the one on the left, well, it seems kind of chaotic. It's never returning exactly to where it started. But if we wait long enough, what we'll see is something very interesting happening. The one that looked like it was simple on the right is starting to move away from being simple. And, oh my goodness, what's happening? <laughs> well, I'll tell you what happened. The one on the right, or maybe it hasn't quite happened yet, in the, sorry, in the accelerator on the right, the particle left the accelerator. So when, when a bunch of particles leaves the accelerator at the energy, with the energy level that I described before, um, it can do things like damage the accelerator. It can even damage the room in which the accelerator is. So um, you want to be able to control for very long periods of time the trajectory of orbits in particle accelerators. Um, the one on the left, by the way, is simple. Um, it might not come back exactly to where it started, but it comes back extremely close. And the fact that it's moving in a circle, we say it's simple. Now, in the design of particle accelerators, you would love to be able to have the left, what happens on the left, always happen. But unfortunately, I mentioned that simple recurrence is very rare. And so you cannot hope for this type of behavior. And you have to deal with the chaotic behavior that we see on the right. So in the complicated dynamical system of the particle accelerator, it's embedded in the following picture. So this is another cross-sectional picture of an orbit, a, a bunch that goes around the accelerator many, many times. The dots represent the position and momentum of a particle as it goes around the ring. For some initial states, like the one on the left, the particle will move around a closed curve forever. These are the simple orbits. But for nearby initial states, there are orbits that recur in a seemingly random fashion, some of them leaving the accelerator entirely. The same picture occurs in abstract mathematical systems where we have names for the orbits. The simply recurrent orbits are called KAM circles. KAM stands for Kolmogorov, Arnold, and Moser, who studied this phenomenon deeply. Uh, and the collection of chaotic orbits is often called a chaotic C. The simple orbits that circle the central one are called elliptic islands. So you see there's, there's little orbits that, that, um, that, that there's little disks that orbit around the center and um, those we call elliptic islands in a chaotic sea. It's very poetic. And there's some picture on the right as well. Um, this is a picture by Kurt McMullen and it's um, an example of um, dynamics on what's called a K3 surface. It comes from a subject, um, a part of dynamics that's connected to what's called algebraic geometry. The same picture appears in a huge swath of physical systems from the flow of fluid around a rotating obstacle to the motion of gases about the North Pole of Saturn. To summarize, mixed recurrence is in many ways to be expected, but from a mathematical perspective, it's the hardest type of recurrence to understand and predict. So now I'd like to turn to a fun application of recurrence, at least want to describe to you 
what you can do when you have recurrence in dis disguise. And the disguise is related to the behavior of numbers. Okay, so um, what I'm going to say maybe doesn't look like it should have anything to do with recurrence of a dynamical system. So in 1927, van der Verden proved the following theorem. Color of the natural numbers, the natural numbers are just one, two, three, four, with two colors. So you have two crayons and each number you color either blue or yellow. And now you, you have to color, it takes infinite time to do this, of course, but imagine you've done this. So now you have a coloring of the natural numbers. What van der Verden's theorem says is that you will always create arbitrarily long monochromatic regular patterns. Let me illustrate what I mean by this. Theorem says that you cannot avoid making patterns. Okay, so let's illustrate this. Here we have some numbers, at least the beginning of the numbers, and we color them. And we continue to color them, and we keep coloring. Okay, so imagine we've now done this to all the natural numbers. Now let me tell you what I mean by monochromatic patterns. So here we have the beginning of our coloring, and you'll notice you probably notice a lot of patterns, but here's one pattern. We see that in this illustration. We see that the numbers 2, 8, and 14 are all blue. And 2, 8, and 14 are evenly spaced from each other. That's called a monochromatic arithmetic progression. It's three numbers evenly spaced, all with the same color. Here's another monochromatic pattern. Five, six, and seven, evenly spaced. Now the difference is one, and they're all yellow. Another monochromatic pattern. These are all monochromatic patterns of length three. Here's a monochromatic pattern of length four. Another of length four. And so on. Here I've, I'm showing you in this particular coloring a monochromatic pattern of length five. This one is length six, seven, and so on. So van der Verden's theorem says that you will find, let me go back, go back to this before I go to this page. Or I show that illustration. So what van der Verden's theorem says is that give me a length 50 and I will find in one, one or two colors, it doesn't matter, but I could actually fix one of the colors, that I can find a monochromatic arithmetic progression of length 50. And you say, okay, well, how about 150? I can find somewhere. I might have to go very far down, but I will always be able to find it. And in fact, if you said 150 billion, I could do the same. Right? That's van der Verden's theorem. And so Hillel Furstenberg proved van der Verden's theorem in the 1980s. And he proved it in a novel way. So this was an older theorem in combinatorics. But Furstenberg, who does dynamical systems, had a different perspective on the problem. So he proved it in a novel way, using dynamical systems and a form of recurrence called multiple recurrence. So this method has been expanded to prove many surprising results, 
such as the theorem of Ben Green and Terry Tao, that the prime numbers contain arbitrarily long arithmetic progressions. So this idea of transferring a problem about numbers into a problem about a dynamical system has turned out to be very fruitful and has allowed us to see very beautiful and deep things about numbers. And you can sort of imagine from that animation I just showed you that, that you can imagine a dynamical system that might be behind this. And literally the dynamical system is something like walking along the natural numbers. But you have to formalize it correctly to get um, to really be able to prove something rigorously. So here is the paper of Furstenberg when he first when he first proved this. And you see it's titled Poincaré Recurrence, which I mentioned before, and number theory. So this is where I wanted to end. I just wanted to say that in another mathematical version of deja vu, old results appear again in surprising new contexts. So for example, Verden, van der Verden's theorem, a classical result, appears again in Furstenberg's result in a study of recurrence in dynamical systems. So many of the most exciting mathematical advances in dynamical systems have no real world applications. So all this work of Poincaré on recurrence, well, okay, he was actually interested in the application to celestial motion, but he had no prediction that this would have any, you know, there would be any application to the question of, uh, particle accelerators. Particle accelerators didn't exist, although Poincaré did some very important work, um, theoretical work, that helped lead to the development of particle accelerators. But the kind of math that I do in dynamical systems doesn't have any application right now. Well, not yet. Thank you. And that is the end of my talk. Thanks, Amy, for a fascinating talk. Um, so I guess, uh, okay, uh, that's it, yeah, okay. So yeah, I have a, I have a question that perhaps I could ask. Uh, yeah. one, one, thing, one thing that um, I found um, really beautiful and fascinating is that um, uh, dynamical systems seem to encompass at least a lot of the a lot of uh, understanding for different types of problems um, so it kind of um, let's say permeates very different a priori areas of mathematics so I would like to know what what was your what drew you to dynamical systems what do you find so beautiful in dynamical systems so the first example that really drew me to dynamical systems was um, was an application or a description of something called the ergodic theorem of Birkhoff. Mm -hmm. And this theorem goes back also to the 1930s um, when people were trying to understand things like ideal gases and planetary motion. And um, it was described to me as follows. Um, suppose I have um, a metallic ring and the temperature is uneven around the ring. Mm -hmm. um, and suppose that I start somewhere on the ring and I just move along the ring in an angle that is an irrational multiple of, of 360 degrees. Mm -hmm. So an irrational angle, an angle that's an irrational number. And I continue and I move and I just take the average temperature. I keep, I, I, I compute the temperature at every point and I average these quantities. And Birkhoff's ergodic theorem says that 
with 100% certainty that the, the, this average that I'm computing over time will in fact compute, will converge to the average temperature of the ring. Mm. And what I loved about this was the, um, well, literally the dynamical aspect of it, the way time played such an important role in um, reaching this conclusion. Um, and there was a, it was a bit of a, it's, it's a bit of a story. You know, there's a story to it. You're, you're, you're taking a trip Absolutely. and in the long run, you're able to um, learn something important. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it was really just the, 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 the kind of almost the storytelling aspects of dynamics that really fascinated me. That's great. Yeah, I see. Uh, I can I can relate to that a lot. There's uh, there's a lot of passion involved in in our love for mathematics, I suppose. Um, also, I mean, maybe this is a bit hard to describe, but uh, I would like to know. I mean, could you say something about the main challenges of dynamical systems? I mean, what is what what are dynamical systems evolving? Uh, like the mathematical theory of dynamical systems, where is it evolving to? Um, what challenges have yeah. you had? Well, so the so first of all, dynamical systems is an extremely broad subject. Sure. So um, and it includes a, a very important part of it is applied dynamical systems. Mm -hmm. And I had touched a little bit upon this when I talked about particle accelerators, but um, I don't really practice applied dynamical systems. Yeah. In pure dynamical systems. Well, so first of all, I can talk about what I'm interested in, mm -hmm. which is the study of smooth dynamical systems. In that field, our challenges are to be able to analyze an arbitrary system or a typical system and get some type of long-term behavior, mm -hmm. understand that long-term behavior. And there are, um, you know, sort of technical issues that come up for sure um, when you're trying to un understand sort of arbitrary systems. But one also is very interested in finding concrete mechanisms that will lead to some very specific behavior like chaotic recurrence or mixed recurrence. And the idea behind finding these very abstract mechanisms is that ultimately they can be used by um, practitioners eventually, or even now, to um, to predict dynamic dynamical behavior in real world examples. Mm -hmm. So I look for general mechanisms that are connected to um, certain types of say chaotic behavior. Um, but I will say. Dynamics also includes a lot of people doing essentially number theory, mm -hmm. really understanding deep and hard questions about numbers using dynamical methods. And there are people who do other, you know, very different types of very geometric dynamics where they understand connections between dynamics and geometry. Mm -hmm. That's something that interests me very much. And there's other, there are other, applications that are fascinating to things like coding, tiling, um, information theory. I mean, the list goes on. That's great. Um, well, um, I have no more questions. Uh, I would like just to remark, uh, well, to say thanks for this fascinating talk and for being so generous with your time and joining us here today. And uh, okay, so I hope there'll be another chance soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, it was my pleasure.